Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloyTutors.com and welcome to this video on electrochemical series and predicting redox reactions. So in this video we're going to look at the uh, electrochemical series and we're going to look at how we can identify oxidizing and reducing agents from an electrochemical series. We're also going to look at something called the anti-clockwise rule which allows us to predict uh, feasible redox reactions and we're also going to look at um, some issues regarding um, predicting reactions that actually appear to not work in reality. So we're going to start by looking at the electrochemical series and I've written uh, some of the electrochemical series on the right hand side there. Now the electrochemical series is basically a, a set of half equations uh, and it also shows us the E0 value of the reaction as well. Now the value has a meaning and I'm going to explain uh, what, it's, what it means and how it can be interpreted for the uh, anti-clockwise rule as well. So you see just some comments to make on it first. We've uh, listed these in a particular order. So in this case I've started with negative E0 values at the top and I'm running all the way down to positive ones at the bottom. And you'll also notice that all the equations here are what we call written in the reduced form. That means that all the species here are accepting electrons. You can see the electrons are all on the left hand side of the equation. Now the numbers are significant because uh, negative values basically tell us that this reaction is unlikely to occur as it's written. So for example, lithium, uh, uh, lithium ion accepting electrons from lithium is unlikely to happen because it's given a negative E0 value. Remember all these are measured in volts as well. So as we go down the group though, the uh, E0 values or the electrical potential values become more positive and this means that these reactions are very likely to happen. So for example, cerium 4 plus picking up an electron to form cerium 3 plus is a likely and feasible reaction uh, on its own. Remember all of these numbers here are uh, calculated by connecting these half cells with the standard hydrogen electrode and that's how we work out these values here. So I've written these uh, two arrows on here to explain uh, how what they actually mean in terms of redox and oxidation. So if we go up the group Basically, the right-hand side species is more likely to be oxidized. So, for example, the lithium on the right-hand side of this one is more likely to be oxidized. In other words, we're just flipping the equation around. So, lithium is going to produce Li plus, plus an electron. That's the more likely reaction. And as we go down the electrochemical um, series, uh, the left-hand side of the species is more likely to be reduced. So, you can see on this side, uh, we say that cerium 4 plus is much more likely to be reduced because it's got the biggest uh, E0 value at the bottom. Now we can use this to um, um, basically state which is the most powerful reducing agent and which one's the most powerful oxidizing agent. But we need to know what they are first. So a reducing agent, remember reduction is the gain of electrons, but a reducing agent will actually uh, lose electrons. So we're looking at something which is very likely to lose electrons and so in this case, a reducing agent is going to be, our more powerful reducing agent is actually going to be lithium. Because this is the species that's furthest, the most negative value at the top. Uh, and this is more likely to lose electrons as a result of that. Remember the negative values, we have to flip the equation around. So lithium would actually make the electrons. Now the most powerful oxidizing agent, so remember oxidation, is uh, the loss of electrons, but the oxidizing agent would actually gain electrons. So we're looking for uh, a species that would gain electrons and is the most positive value because this means it's very likely to happen. So the most powerful uh, oxidizing agent would be this one, cerium 4 plus. And so this would be the most powerful oxidizing agent. Uh, sometimes in the exam they do ask you to uh, comment on that as well. So um, and and give a reason why. And so this one's got the most powerful, uh, got the most positive E naught value. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're now going to predict uh, a feasible redox reaction, and we're going to use this method called the anti-clockwise rule. Uh, and the basic rule of the anti-clockwise rule is basically we put the most negative E naught goes on the top of the equation. So remember to work out the E naught of a cell, we need to have two half cells. So I've just picked two here. We've got chromium 3 plus to chromium 2 plus and chlorine to Cl minus ions. And I've just picked these from the electrochemical series. 
Uh, I've also written the E0 values next to them as well. Now you can see that the most negative E0 I've stuck on the top. In this case was chromium 3 plus chromium 2 plus. So how the uh, anticlockwise works is we write our two equations, put the most negative on the top, uh, and then we're going to find out which is the feasible reaction. So we're going to start on the right hand side. I'll do this in blue. So as long as the most negative is on the top, we go anticlockwise. So we write arrow going that way and an arrow going that way. And so this shows us uh, effectively like an anticlockwise uh, movement around our two equations. Now, what we can do with that is we can actually write out our full ionic equation. And before we do that, we have to balance our electrons. So you can see we've got one electron here and two here. So what we need to do is we need to balance these out. So we multiply this top row by two, uh, and that should get us two lots of Cr3+, plus, two electrons, and two Cr2+. Plus. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to cancel out our two electrons on both sides, as you can see here, and then we write out our full ionic equation. That's the feasible reaction. So we start from the end of this arrow, so we put two Cr2+, plus, and that's going to react with the end of this arrow. So remember, we're going from here to the product here. This is the product of the reaction. And then this is a reactant, and this is going to the product. So this was a reactant, because we're starting at this end of the arrow, and this is a reactant. So we're going to put Cl2 there, because this is at that end of the arrow. And then everything at the arrow head is a product. So we've got 2Cr3+, plus, which is there. Uh, and you can see on this side, we've got plus 2Cl minus, and that's on the right hand side. So everything at the end of an arrow head goes as a product, as you can see, and anything at the start of the arrow goes as a reactant. So the reaction that's feasible in this case is Cr2 plus reacting with chlorine to form Cr3 plus and 2Cl minus. That's the only one that's feasible. Anything else than that, sometimes the exam might give you an equation and ask if this reaction is feasible. What you should do is draw out your half equation, uh, write out your half equations, do your anti-clockwise rule, find out what is feasible, and then compare that with what the exam has given you. And if it doesn't match, then obviously the one that the examiners have given you is not a feasible reaction. This is the only one that should be feasible. Okay, so we're going to look at the uh, next bit and see how we can apply this as well. Um, so sometimes they'll ask you why you should not use HCl to acidify potassium permanganate solution. This is particularly useful in titrations when you're using permanganate as an oxidizing agent, and we're going to use that to perhaps um, uh, oxidize uh, iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus, for example, in a redox titration. So, but you've got to acidify your permanganate. Now, you shouldn't use hydrochloric acid uh, to acidify it, and we're going to explain why using E0 values. So, what I've done is I've written down our uh, chlorine uh, half equation because it's hydrochloric acid. Uh, hydrochloric acid will dissociate to form H plus ions and Cl minus ions. So I've written down the equation with Cl minus ions in there already. And that's Cl2 plus two electrons will form two Cl minus. Uh, I've also written up manganate equation here at the bottom. So we put the most negative on top. Now both of these have positive values, but the chloride one is the most negative uh, compared to uh, the manganate one there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, Draw our anti-clockwise arrows. So I'm going to start from the right hand side. I'm going to draw an arrow going along there, and then an arrow going along there. So this is showing the rotation of our molecules, of our uh, equation, sorry. So you can see here that it's not balanced either. So we need to get all these numbers balanced. So you've got five electrons here and two here. So what we need to do to balance out the electrons so we can combine them is to multiply the top row by five um, and multiply the bottom one by two. And that will give us 10 electrons on top and bottom, and then we can cancel them out. So uh, we're going to do that now. So we'll put multiply this top one by 5. So we'll have 5 at the start there. This will then turn into a 10, uh, and this will be 10 as well. And we multiply all of the bottom one by 2. So we'll put 2 in front of 2MnO4 minus. 2 times 8 is going to be 16 H plus. We're going to have 10 electrons there. We're going to have uh, two lots of Mn2 plus there, and we're going to have eight waters at the end there. So once we've balanced all that out, we then cross out our electrons, cancel them out, uh, and then we rewrite our equation, our ionic equation. So you can see we start from the start of the arrowheads, and we write them down as products. So we've got 10 Cl minus, as you can see here, plus, and then on this side we have 
2 mn04 minus plus 16h plus, uh, and that will produce, this should be reversible, let's change that, uh, that will produce the products on the end of the arrowhead, so that's 5 lots of Cl2 plus 2 lots of Mn2 plus, uh, plus 8H2O. Now you can see, if we look at this equation here, if we added, if we acidified uh, permanganate with hydrochloric acid, the chloride ions, which are in hydrochloric acid, would actually react with the manganate ions, which are here, which are the purple purple solution, uh, and it will actually reduce these manganate ions to Mn2+. Now, this would happen in the burette before you've even started titrating, and obviously this isn't any good. We don't want the permanganates to be reduced in the burette. We want the contents of the conical flask to do the reducing, so you would never use hydrochloric acid for that reason. And thanks to the anti-clockwise rule, we can prove that and we can demonstrate actually this is the feasible reaction, and this is what will happen if we add chloride ions to the manganese. Uh, now, this is theoretical. This is what should happen in theory. But um, that's the reason why we don't use it. And really, what we should use is sulfuric acid instead uh, of hydrochloric acid to acidify our permanganates. But that's quite a common question. It could be a question that the examiners could ask in your paper as well. Okay, so just moving on to the final thing, which is uh, looking at some problems with the anti-clockwise rule. Now, the anti-clockwise rule works in theory. In practice, reactions may not appear to actually work. So, um, we're going to look at this effect of concentration. Now, remember, the anti-clockwise rule works because we're using uh, standard conditions. So that would be uh, 100 kilopascals of pressure, uh, 298 Kelvin, and uh, we're assuming that all the concentrations of any solutions are 1 moles per dm cube. This is actually very difficult to achieve. Uh, in reality, and so therefore values can change. So let's say, for example, we've got these two half equations here. You can see we've got lead and two electrons, or lead two plus accepted two electrons to form lead, uh, and then bromine accepted two electrons to form two lots of bromide ions. Now I've written the uh, E naught values on there as well. And so if we change the concentration, that's going to have an effect on the E naught value uh, or the overall. Uh, e naught of your cell. So, for example, if we increase the concentration of Pb2, what's going to happen is, uh, according to Le Chatelier's principle, equilibrium will shift to the right to try and use up them lead 2 plus ions. Now, the forward reaction in this reaction is negative anyway, it's a minus 0 0.13. So, this reaction is actually more likely to be oxidized because of this negative value. So, if we increase the concentration of this, we're going to shift equilibrium to the right. And so that means this value here will actually become more negative. So we're going to write that down there. So the E naught of the cell, the overall cell, uh, will actually become more negative. Uh, because as you can see, this reaction is negative anyway. So if we push uh, equilibrium even further to the right, then this number is going to get even smaller. Um, and uh, that's effectively how that works. So if we look at the other equation, if we increase the concentration of bromine, for example, in this reaction, then um, again, uh, we're going to reduce the amount of, um, uh, sorry, we're going to, equilibrium is going to shift to the right to try and reduce the amount of bromine that we've added. So increase the concentration of this, equilibrium is going to shift to the right, we're going to use up more electrons. Now this equation going that way is positive 1.07, so this reaction is going to become even more positive uh, because we're pushing equilibrium further to the right. So this number is actually going to become more positive. So the E naught of the cell uh, is going to become more positive as a result of that. Okay, right. Uh, just the final thing as well, another thing which can affect the anticlockwise rule is kinetics. Uh, this is a really common answer. Um, so, for example, uh, you might have something like um, the reaction may be very slow. So you might look at something like rust. So you might have an iron gate that's rusting. Now, uh, iron is a, iron reacting with oxygen is a feasible reaction. It's a rusting process, but you don't see it before your eyes because actually it's a very slow process. That doesn't mean that the reaction is not happening though. So you've got to be aware of that. Even though it may say it's feasible, it may be feasible, but it may take years and years for this reaction to actually work and for you to see the results of it. And the other thing though is sometimes the reaction actually doesn't go at all. 
even though it suggests it's feasible here, uh, and that's sometimes some reactions can have an activation energy that's so high that at the standard temperature and pressure, uh, it actually doesn't proceed uh, because the activation energy is too high. But um, that's it. Hope that helps. Bye.